TV. All TV. Please, uh, please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge All allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for November 13th, 2017. Uh, not, um, public meeting, public comment period. Anybody wishing to make public comment, please come up, identify yourself and your address. Jerry Zanoy here, 16 Presidential Circle in Hampton. I have read thoroughly the uh, Wright Pierce report. It's a 200 page report. I went over it every page, every line in detail. I'm not done with my analysis, but I have read the report. Some items I'd like to bring out. Ventilation throughout appears over and over and over again. I see no, no sense of putting new equipment into areas that aren't ventilated. So I think we've got to hit ventilation as a priority before we put new equipment in this place. Second of all, we have to continue the plan to reduce infiltration and inflow. That stuff coming in from bad pipes or sewer covers or whatever. It's making up 56% of, of our water flow into the plant per table 2-4 uh, of this uh, and years 2012 through 16. Per, per this uh, report. So continue to work infiltration, and I like their recommendation of what they think that might cost us on a yearly basis. The aeration process, I see that as critical and Achilles heel. This process was changed in 2003 from the uh, original design to a new modified aeration process. When that was changed, the limits were changed. Millions of gallons of dray dropped from 4.7 to 3.9, and the TTS and BOD dropped as well. Right now, we are at the limits, if not exceeding, these two parameters, and we stand the risk of the state in the meeting and having to review every single permit of water going into that plant right now. That needs to be reviewed one way or the other. Either go back to the original design and add some processes in there that would accommodate the pH and, pH and other factors, or take the existing process, which is ganged together, and you can't clean any tanks to repair them, and add more tanks. But someone's got to be there in a hurry. <clears throat> industrial suppliers. We need to supply, we need to control our industrial suppliers tighter than we have. We have a major guy on the block, we know who they are, who's been delivering a lot of uh, solids to the plant. That has to be controlled through constant visits, constant validating of their sampling, and cast, constantly validating that they're living to their pre -treat treatment requirements. If not, problem will not go away. And we can hit him with a uh, surcharge fee. I love that. That's another recommendation, right, right, Pierce. I agree that defective parts need to be replaced. I agree that parts needing repair are repaired. I agree that parts that are at or near end of life be replaced on a priority basis, of course. I agree that the identified safety problems be corrected. What are the costs of these that I just said? I don't know. Table 4.1 on page 427 talks about 35 million bucks. I don't know a thing about that 35 million dollars. I hope it's not all building costs because they have mentioned putting a new grit building in, putting a new septics building in, putting a new operation building in or expanding it, and correcting the maintenance garage and expanding it. Right now, I'm talking about fixing things, not building buildings. I don't know what 4.1 page 4-27 says. It's 35 million, I think, out of the 41 that Chris Jacobs was talking about. I have no idea. I can't comment on that until I know. Okay, and lastly, there is a risk. The current permit is five years past due. The risk is that they give us another permit down the road, if you will, and it now requires us metals to be reduced or anything else, blah, blah, blah. It might require more space and another process. That's all. I'm just bringing this up. It's a risk, especially copper and some of the metals, aluminum, whatever. So we have to have a plan. We have to go forward. It has to be a prudent one. I'm for spending money, but it has to be prudent. I have read this report thoroughly. I have not finished my analysis, but these are the things I have seen. Thank you very much for your three minutes. <laughs> I hope I met it. <laughs> uh, almost. <laughs> Thanks. I timed it on my microwave. And I All right. It <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else wishing to make public comment? That's quick. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Deborah Borbo, and I am a resident at 44 Hobson Ave in Hampton. 
and I am here tonight to speak in favor of Warren article regarding the study for the town flooding issue. Um, we have a group of individuals down on the west side of um, Ashworth Ave and Brown Ave that have gotten together and started to review the high tides and the flooding and what the tidal issues are doing to our homes and our property. So we're here tonight to speak in favor of the Warren article and ask your um, acceptance and vote in favor of it. We would appreciate your support as we move forward. We know that there is no resolution um, at this time, but the study we do believe will give us some hope moving forward in the future as the tides continue to rise and affect all of our properties. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to make public comment? Yes. Uh, representing the uh, Green Street Gentian on uh, exactly the same, the flooding issues. And um, I'd like to th thank the, ish the efforts that have been made. They've really made a big difference with the dredging um, behind uh, Gentian. But I'm, I am representing um, Tom Bassett and all of the folks that are away, and I live closest. But... Um, we just hope that you will consider putting our our uh, article, our warrant article, on um, the agenda. And uh, I'm here just to let you know that uh, we would like your vote, you know, your help with this. And uh, that's it. I'm not a very good speaker. I was expecting someone else here, and I was going to follow the lead. But thank you. Did a good job. Did an excellent job. Anybody else wishing to make public comment? Good evening. My name is Steve Belgiorno. I'm here with my wife, Karen Belgiorno, this evening. Uh, we own property on Manchester Street, and we're here in support of the Warren article, also about the flooding. Um, we've gone through 12 years of this now, and we're seeing continually get worse. Uh, in December, we have a flood coming of um, 10.8 and the winter is not going to be letting up also so we do appreciate the support behind this we've seen a lot of the town down the street taking pictures and it's starting to become an issue um, and it's starting to become well known throughout the community and we just thank again thanks again for the support thank you Good. anybody else for public comment Charlie Preston, 47 Glade Path. I know flooding, but I'm here more to talk about infiltration in the, in the treatment plant. In my street, people that are familiar with it, off of 101, I'm, I'm in the middle of the estuary. I read 33 pages of the 226 Wright Pierce report, and that, that was enough for me. The inflow and the infiltration. The 10 foot high tie plus ties, the high salinities, the polymer that has to be added. When, when you read it, it just scares you. The re, they're talking about rehabilitating manholes to reduce the inflow and infl infiltration. My street just recently, I'm going to say within the last two weeks, they did nine manhole structures, excuse me, 11. The ninth one from the West End is the one in front of my house. It's the only one that wasn't change because someone put a green X on it. I was brought aware of it from a neighbor who walks their dog a lot, but 10 out of the last 11 seem to have hinges on them now. And I don't know, you know, if that's an infiltration issue or not. But after reading 33 pages of the 226, it was enough to convince me you might need to assess and structure rates for residential, commercial, and industrial users. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else for public comment? Seeing none, we will move to announcements and community calendar. Nothing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to remind everybody the Christmas parade again is coming up. They're working diligently to do it, uh, to make sure we have a great parade. They also wanted me to make sure I invited the Board of Selectmen and the Town Manager yes, sir. Uh, to participate in the parade this year. 
Uh, I'm sure I know in the past you've ridden with Public Works, I believe, or, the police, or the police and, and stuff. And so those vehicles will be in there, or if people want to march, uh, they'd be more than happy to have us come come along. So very good, thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Yes, we have a notice here about free boots and jackets for those in need. Free winter boots and jackets for men, women, and children of all shapes and sizes are available for those who need them. The boots and coats will be given out beginning uh, Tuesday, December 12th at 10.30 a.m. to 12 noon at Our Lady of Miraculous Metal Church at the St. Vincent de Paul Building, 289 Lafayette Road, Hampton, White House, behind the back of the parking lot on the right. Event sponsored by the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I would just like to say, in conjunction with the Christmas parade on December 3rd, December 2nd is the tree lighting. December 1st, the parade is uh, second. December 1st is the tree lighting, and December 2nd is the parade. And the tree lighting is a great event down in the square, and everybody should attend it, Ken. Did I ask Phil? You, you didn't, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize. No, no, no need to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have no announcements. Thank you, sir. Okay. Consent agenda. Hampton Cemetery Deeds, Marilyn, uh, okay, Marilyn Brown and Dale Brown. Acceptance of donation of $400 from Sprague Energy for the Hampton Food Pantry. Authorization of the town manager to sign the HUD statement for 50 Ancient Highway, 50 Ancient Highway HUD closing statement. Security acceptance for the New Hampshire School of Mechanical Trades, $9,800. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? <laughs> unanimous appointments chief sawyer police department donation of hampton police department from the crime line for the hamptons in the amount of three thousand dollars welcome mr chairman i also have uh, colonel mike antonio with me from the uh junior rotc program <coughs> up at one kind of high school for the second item welcome uh, sir uh first item is the donation to the hampton police department from the crime line of the hamptons in the amount of three thousand uh, Crime Line for the Hamptons, great organization. We've been working with them for years. Um, it's just a cash donation for us to use at our discretion for any purchases of equipment that we may find uh, useful in our mission. So I would look for a uh, vote uh, from the board to allow us okay. to accept that. I'll make that motion. Get a motion? Second. Seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Second is uh, B, is wreaths across America on December 11th, 2017. I'm going to let the Colonel explain to you what wreaths across America is, and then I'll explain to you the operational plan and the road closures that I see from the board. Okay, sir. Uh, wreaths across America has been um, in action for about the last 12 years. They came through our town last year. We're the only stop in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, they take, basically take a thousand wreaths from upstate Maine, uh, donations and all that stuff. They load them into about 12 tractor trailers. Uh, they have Gold Star family members, and they take about a week to get down to Arlington Cemetery. And that final day, they put a wreath on every, cemet uh, on every headstone in Arlington. So they stop here. They give us an opportunity to uh, recognize some of our local residents. Uh, we have four uh, nominated right now that we honor. Uh, they'll take place in front of the American Legion on the high street. Uh, usually about a 45-minute ceremony uh, will honor those uh, four to five individuals. Uh, the uh, Winnicott Winkler JRTC will escort the Gold Star family members. Uh, we'll have uh, the high school band will be there. The <coughs> procession uh, leading them up to the American Legion, and then we'll play taps. We'll have the uh, the bagpipes. Uh, fire department, half the police department will uh, assist. Uh, American Legion, Marine Corps League. So basically, a large part of the community and uh, veteran organizations will get together and honor these local residents as this convoy passes through uh, through the town of Hampton. Our basic game plan is what we did last year. Uh, it is a large convoy with a number of vehicles, but there's also support vehicles bringing people that are traveling uh, with the group down to Arlington. It includes a lot of police agencies that provide the escort, Maine State Police, a lot of agencies from northern Maine that go all the way to Arlington with them. So it's uh, it was a great event last year. It's just uh, prior to the holiday season, and what we would seek is we want to close High Street in the section of our road between the Mill Road lights all the way west to Dearborn Road for the uh, duration of the ceremony. At the end of the ceremony, the vehicles will all pull back out into a convoy out onto Route 1 and headed south, and they'll travel Route 1 south all the way down to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts into their next stop. 
So I'm seeking permission to shut the road down for traffic safety for that approximate hour that we're going to need to uh, conduct our ceremony. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Any discussion? It's a great program. All in favor? Unanimous. Super. Okay. And the last item uh, is the Planet Fitness Training Facility used for Hampton First Responders. Uh, I spoke with Chief Ayotte uh, from the Fire Department. He, he was uh, in agreement, so we should just let the board know that uh, the new corporate facility out there has their, uh, their model gym out there, and they have invited uh, the first responders, knowing that physical fitness is a key part to serving. Uh, the free use of that gym. It's not a membership. It's only for that facility, but that's being opened up for the use of the Hampton Police Department and the Hampton Fire Rescue personnel. So we just wanted to let the board know that uh, that was offered to us, and we wanted to thank Point of Fitness for that. Uh, uh, does that include Selectman as first responders, Chief? Uh, I think you passed your prime, Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> you think? I, I think it's a great idea. The facility out there is wonderful. I think it's, it's, it's great that they... Uh, they allow our people to go out there. I think we ought to uh, send them a, a thank you letter yeah. from, the, from the Board of Selection. Will do. Super. That's all I have for this evening. That's all. It's nice seeing you. Sweet. Thank, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for the service. Thanks. Wright Pierce Engineers report on the wastewater treatment plant. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. Get this disconnected here. As soon as you get all connected, if everybody can identify themselves and Looks like that's firing up now, but uh, I'm Tim Vadney with Wright Pierce, the project manager for this project. Um, so we... Uh, Mike Doobie. Mike Doobie. Mike, I asked Mike to come here tonight as the supervisor of the wastewater treatment plant. If there's some technical issues that he can answer, uh, how they've been operating the plant, how they've uh, nursed the plant along at this point, uh, he was here. I also wanted to note that behind us is... Uh, Jennifer Hale, my deputy director, and Tim, uh, Mike Curry, sorry, with uh, Wright Pierce. Mike's been uh, Tim's right-hand man putting together a lot of these numbers. So uh, with that, we'll let the show Tim have the floor. So uh, here's a brief overview of what I'm planning on talking about today. The plan is to keep it pretty brief and to facilitate questions that you may have on, on the report that, that we put out on the, on the facility plan. So we did introductions already. I'm going to give a brief overview of the treatment facility and its history and the history of upgrades there. I'll talk a little, little bit about what the drivers were for the facility plan that brought us to here, and then some of the findings and recommendations of that facility plan, and ultimately some of the phasing and costs of various upgrades there that, that, that are necessary. So like many industries, wastewater engineering is laden with acronyms. So I put this, this slide in to basically touch upon some of the main ones we'll see, WWTF, wastewater treatment facility. When we talk about flow to the facility, it's usually an MGD or million gallons per day. When we talk about the load or pollutants that are in the flow coming to the wastewater, it's usually in one, primarily in one of two forms, BOD, which is biochemical oxygen demand, and TSS, or total suspended solids. Both of these play a role in the capacity of the plant. So a little background of the plant. I believe it's one of the oldest continuously operating plants in the state. I think maybe only Durham has you beat. So, and the beach drove that in the 1930s when the original plant was upgraded. It's been upgraded since then a number of times. Uh, the large ones are presented here. The, the last, the most recent comprehensive upgrade was the 1974 upgrade, which built most of the buildings that you see in purple up there. This is this chart. This aerial photo is, is color color coded by approximately by age. So anything that's in kind of that greenish teal color is post-1986. Anything before that is 1974 and before. And some of the stuff there dates to well before 94 as well. But most of the equipment in the purple areas is from the 74 upgrade. So a little bit of facility planning. What is a facility plan? 
basically we do these for communities that know they have a need at the plant and they want to help categorize or understand what that need is and the, the, the town has known that you know we got this resource there probably one of the biggest dollar value resources in the town to construct that plant new n nowadays would be in the order of 40 to 50 million easily we're building the plant of similar size in Exeter right now and at the total project cost is in the vicinity of 50 million so uh, facility plans are to assess the existing condition of the facility, look at flows and loads, look at any growth projections, and kind of weave that into a plan for moving forward, for keeping the plant up to speed and upgraded and, and working the way it needs to for the reliability that you need from it. Uh, and yeah, lay out that upgrades and a schedule for it over the coming years. So some of the you know, main findings of the, of the facility plan, there's basically two types of need at the treatment plant. There's the replacement of aging infrastructure, which is both the process equipment, like the pumps, the piping, the fans, the blowers, the diffusers, the mixers, the chemical pumps, and the building systems, the buildings which house this equipment, whether it's ventilation, like Mr. Zanoli spoke to, or whether it's other building systems like masonry and roofs and things like that. Uh, and then the, the second need kind of overarching need there is the capacity concern, concerns due to growth within town. Not just residential growth, but the, the growth that occurs when more people come to the beach and the growth of industrial users as well. And that comes in, in, in terms of increasing flows and in gallons per day, but more importantly for Hampton right now in terms of load. That's what's in the sewage that's coming to the plant that needs to be treated. So when we do these facility plans we typically try to triage the needs of the plant into phases and so we've done that here with a phase one and this is the high priority immediate kind of some some life safety some code issues and, and the highest priority equipment needs uh, that would be more your more immediate immediate project and then phase two which is the stuff that's probably five plus years out and then phase three which is kind of further out than that and the way these really work is as you progress through the next decade that phase three stuff becomes phase one stuff as it continues to age so it's kind of a cycle of upgrading equipment and, and, and how that plays out so a little bit I want to talk about now is some specifics on the recommended phase one upgrade and uh, we'll get into more detail on each of these but the overview is multiple system upgrades at the at the facility the total estimated project costs are phase one total project is 13.8 uh, a potential schedule if the town depending on how the town decides to move forward to this I know there's warrant article approval and your approval and all that uh, and needs to go into it as well uh, would be design it in the coming year and start construction bid it in, in 2019 for construction there uh, thereafter so what is in the phase one upgrade and this is all obviously in the facility plan but I realize it's also a pretty dense report uh, so it's improvements to the and we'll talk about each of these in more detail shortly but improvements to the headworks the aeration tanks the primary clarifiers and thickeners the plant water and septage receiving facilities the sludge pumps and uh, polymer systems some improvements to the operation building and maintenance garage and the SCADA system upgrade now what SCADA is is it stands for supervisory control and data acquisition it's basically the computer system that runs the equipment at the plant a uh, little bit on the headworks upgrade so there's this is a very challenging space it's a space where the ventilation is not in great shape and that that, that accelerates the, the rate of corrosion on the equipment and also cor corrosion of the concrete that's in those spaces uh, there's some walkways that really need to get replaced there's some equipment some HVAC that needs to get replaced and uh, basically other worn out equipment that has reached that it, the end of its anticipated useful life just to be for the for the audience just to be clear the headworks is literally where all the effluent comes into the plant comes in from the force mains uh, uh, from the church street pump sp station uh, also comes down tide mill road and we have a what we call a northeast corridor uh, collection main uh, so this is literally raw effluent uh, where it comes that's a great plant. great thing to touch on I should have said that it's yeah the, all the raw sewage comes through this it's got a mechanical screen that screens debris from the wastewater and it's got a grit removal system that settles out the sand and larger rock particle particles so does this have to do with the um the, the uh, line that goes across the marsh it pumps to this to this part of the facility so this would include replacing that no, that no, is a separate no. that's, that's a separate, separate one yeah okay this is all within the treatment plant site okay thank you yeah. 
So a ration tank upgrade. This would be one of the ones that would increase the treatment facility capacity, uh, again, to, to replace equipment that has reached the end of its useful life, uh, to provide some redundancy, because right now, as uh, Mr. Zanoia touched upon, it, there's one aeration train. This would provide the redundancy of having two, so you could take one down for maintenance, which right now you don't entirely have that flexibility, especially during the summer when you need all tanks online. And also, this provide emergency generation, gener power generation facilities for the aeration system. Right now, your aeration system ha is not on the generator at the plant. So the power goes out, you cannot provide the dissolved oxygen you need to make the aeration tanks do their biological treatment of the wastewater. And the, the town has done a great job kind of, they had they wired in a temporary generator hookup. So they have the ability, ability during a pr prolonged power outage to hopefully, if you can find a sufficiently sized generator, to get that there and hook it up, but that has a lead time too. But it is a source of risk for the for the community that that's not on standby power. Uh, that's the aeration tank upgrade. Uh, one of the drivers for that, like we touched upon a little bit, is the capacity of the plant. We are flirting with that 80% threshold. Upon exceeding that threshold, DES has ability to meddle or interfere a little bit more in growth within the town, which I think we've seen before in, in previous years. So we want to avoid that as well. So, and so we've done a ton of, you know, here's another chart of that loading. Obviously it's during the summer, you know, because the seasonal use, nature of the beach and of operations there. Uh, and we can come back to any of these as, have, as you have questions. I just want to kind of get through. And if you have any questions as we go, don't hesitate to jump in here. To One point I'd like to make on that is, uh, about three years ago, actually 2014, there was a rule change. Um, in the past, we've always been controlled or our permit has been limited by how many million gallons per day you can process. In 2014, they added not only is that one of your operational criteria, but your BOD max is your operational criteria. That got put on everybody statewide through the Department of Environmental Services and it's a, in direct relationship to the number of microbreweries and other types of, you know, uh, uh, loaded facilities that are being constructed around the state. We're not the only community <clears throat> that has a, a higher BOD load. I know Concord does. I know uh, well, so, yeah, Max so is huge. Summersworth just is tapped out. So everybody for the same or similar reasons. It's an important distinction that prior to that rule change, it was just 80% of your flow capacity, meaning the number of gallons of water that came in. And you guys are doing okay there. But they added to also include organic load, which you have a, you have a fairly concentrated wastewater due to the nature of the waste. So that is what that is what we're bumping into this threshold now. We regularly during the summer go over, but we don't go over cons for three months consecutively. And we're trying not to... We're trying to be proactive and not allow that to occur. And another important distinction to make is that you go over the 80% threshold, the plant has an exemplary compliance record in terms, in terms of meeting its effluent permit limit. So these guys do a great job running the plant despite the high loadings that are within the design capacity. So a little more on the aeration tank upgrade. Uh, this is a little tough to see, we can zoom in here, but it, you, right now these two tanks exist in the original 74 upgrade, this area was ghosted in for additional tankage, as I recollect. Yes. So that's the most logical place for additional tankage. That's, that, that, that space has been reserved on site. Uh, that's what I had on the aeration tank process. Next, primary clarifier and gravity thickener mechanism upgrade. Uh, the mechanisms in these tanks date, I believe, to the 74 upgrade. So, and they've been turning pretty much continuously since then. I mean, this plant never shuts off. It runs 24 hours a day. And they have the ability to alternate trains, but it's still a phenomenal number of hours that are, is on that equipment. Uh, so mechanisms, some concrete repair in those tanks, and some perimeter uh, rails to meet some uh, Department of Labor standards, life safety requirements. Uh, plant water and septage upgrades. So the they use a lot of water at the plant for wash down and other purposes. Instead of using aquarian water, they actually use their treated effluent to do that and save a bunch of money on having to buy that water. But that pumping system is in need of upgrades. And also the way that they are forced to handle septage due to some equipment and tankage limitations drives a pretty high plant water demand. So the, this upgrade will include some modifications of the septage receiving facilities, the plant water system, and some septage pumping capabilities. 
Uh, sludge pumps and polymer, up, uh, polymer upgrades, this is just more of the same. Uh, equipment which has reached the end of its useful life and is in need of, of uh, replacement and some additional equipment redundancy with the polymer system. Uh, operations building upgrade, that's the uh, some modifications to some chemical storage areas to more further enclose them to contain some of the corrosive gases that those chemicals contain. Uh, upgrades to some heating, ventilation, and air conditioning or HVAC equipment in those spaces. And uh, so it says traditional office space, but I believe the uh, mate that was the garage, the new office space was actually in phase two, not phase one. So that was working with some existing stuff to try to carve out some office space. And we're not looking on this particular item when it comes to additional office space. We're not looking for just to give somebody a new office. The bottom picture uh, that he has on the right, that's actually Mike's desk. And behind Mike's desk is all the electrical control panels, all the switches that run uh, the plant. Um, his desk is too close to those electrical panels. Well, and it's not a, yeah, it's exactly right. I didn't want to get, <laughs> but yeah, it's exact. That photo there is a it's an electric room that people are using as office space. Our architect nearly had a heart attack when he walked in there. Okay. Didn't love that. It, it's a it's a, it's another one of those operational like the like the odor control. It's an operational issue that we're trying to uh, eliminate for the safety of our employees. Yeah. Uh, Maintenance garage upgrade. Now, the, the maintenance garage, which is across the street from the building where Mike's office is currently. Oh, another thing I want to say before I forget. Uh, if you Is anyone interested in doing a tour of the plant? Because I think that could really help demonstrate. That'd be, if we could set up a tour of the plant to really show you something, it might make a lot more sense than my photos and presentation on it to see it firsthand. Uh, so the maintenance garage is one of the older structures on site. It's been repurposed over the years from many different uses, and right now it's a combination of many uses. It's a garage, it's office space, it's a lavatory, it's a mechanical process space. And uh, it suffice to say there's some code issues that exist there as well with that combination of uses. So this would address some of the larger items there and upgrade the HVAC and ventilation stuff there. I think the last one I wanted to drill down on for the phase one upgrade is the SCADA upgrade. This is that computer system that controls the plant. Uh, right now, that computer system is housed in a trailer out just outside the plant, not and uh, would not a great location for a bunch of computer equipment. Uh, part of this upgrade would be relocating that into the operations building. And another big one is to separate the treatment plants network from the town's overall network. One of the best design, pra the design practices we like to see is see those computer systems not combined so that the, the system at the treatment facility is more isolated and less, less vulnerable. Uh, so that's kind of all I brought to talk about, kind of lay out the phases and talk in a little bit more detail about phase one. I imagine you have some questions for us. I think uh, Mr. Zanoy asked some good questions about additional detail on the cost, which we can pull together too per phase. Regina? Um, so the 13.8 million for phase one, that would be, we would go bid for it ideally if it was this year and then bond it for 19. Yeah. And, uh, we, and we, that would be for the whole 13.8 million. Hold yeah. up. Well, could that That's been part of the, it was part of some of our discussions and right, okay. discussions earlier today. We'd like the authority to bond $15 million um, that, that well covers the thirteen eight. Um, it's up to, once we had that amount of money and, and they actually get into the engineering, um, we would look, be looking for um, ways to do things. For instance, all the headwork projects. Some of them were listed phase one, phase two, and phase three, but in some respects, it, from a efficiency, uh, m more efficient methods of construction, it makes sense to do all those things at once. So um, we, we literally couldn't spend all $13.8 in, in one shot, one time. We'd literally go nuts. We, imagine, we still have to run this plant while we make these changes. We can't really take the thing off the line. So certain things are going to have to get done at certain times. So, you know, we would go do some of the headwork stuff, uh, the design and engineering for the two new aeration lagoons. 
would probably take you know months, if not years, longer than just replacing some of the, the equipment in the headworks. Um, so then, while the aeration is going on, well, we'd probably go and do other plant or other pump modifications. Different things would be combined in different orders. So it, it would Emily through Fred's office would come back to the board. You know, maybe do it two more bonds. I don't know, or or maybe do it one. I don't know. But that's I have to leave that to the finance office and Fred's um, guidance. Okay. No, I mean I read through most of this report, and it's uh, I think I mean it's a little bit scary. Like some of the safety concerns in some, most of the buildings. It yeah. Seems like I definitely would be interested in a tour. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's a great idea. I think even. I don't know if you could set it up so that if residents wanted well, to. Well, one of, some of the notes that I have down here to talk about at the end, if we looked at uh, proactive steps this department would like to take, would be one, uh, a tour with just a limited group, board of selectmen, uh, maybe some key members of the budget committee, if, you know, or right. maybe all of them. But not because it's an operational plant and um, we have air quality issues, we have to go through with gas meters with you folks. So it isn't like we could take 100 people. So we wanted a limited tour of, if you will, uh, the selectmen and whoever else you sell. Uh, then we would open it up to tours by the public, on, and we recognize we'd probably have to occur on a Saturday. Uh, we'd ask people to sign up through the email system or directly call in the office. We could you know, definitely take people through. There's some areas, like walking all the way down to the headworks, no. We'd, and trip hazard, fall hazards, it's also a very odorous area. Um, the, uh, we'd also like to uh, work with uh, Wright Pierce. In the past, they've prepared video presentations. Uh, they did on our 2006 project when the upper left clarifier was built. Uh, helps educate the people as to these are the things that you know, we're, uh, we're facing. Um, and and you know, maybe it can be brought into a couple of different segments. Um, we'd also, you know, we know that we have to make future, future presentations to not only the budget committee, but then ultimately the town deliberative session. And if I could steal something from Mike's, he's gone and prepared, and we, we got the idea from somebody else. But these are, this is a present day situational chart with the Hampton Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's been set up, you know, with design date on the backs and photos, but also how the plant's laid out and the different aspects. We're also going to do one that says these are the areas we'd like to tackle under phase one with some of the photos. And we'll make these available for people. Um, so not everybody has to come and literally tour the plant. So um, that's where we'd like to take it, but it's based upon, if you will, the discussion, further questions from you folks, and, and where you'd like to go with this. And Wright Pierce also mentioned that a way to maybe offset some of these costs would be to charge surcharges. To no. larger customers, I know we have a few that we already do, but we do. We one of the things that, that uh, Tim mentioned is, for instance, uh, for high strength waste loads that we get. Uh, right now, we set a daily limit for the amount of BOD that you will know, come in from the high strength users. If they, for some reason, have a big run day and they send us more BOD, we have a way of tracking that or figuring it out. Uh, we'd actually back charge them forty-two dollars per hundred pounds. Was oh, uh, yeah, I think that's a uh, yeah, appendix A of the facility plan has a memo we wrote on uh, industrial surcharges, and we included what several other area communities charge for a BOD surcharge for uh, industrial users like this to help offset some of that cost. It's a way of recovering it, but at forty-two dollars per hundred pounds, it's kind of like putting pennies in the piggy bank. Um, you know, we can o we can only good to do it, but we can only do it for so long. And and, and Select and Bean, I know, is going to raise the question, and because he's already done it by email and I've given you something, uh, of about possibly addressing or revisiting how we actually charge for sewer services. And that is something we can definitely work on. But it's, it was not part of the, uh, when we talk about a facilities plan, it literally is the physical facility. How you want to get it done or make changes is more of what's known as a rate study, which is a whole different way of looking at things. But it is possible. Once we have phase one, two, and three done, 
How much more capacity does the plant have? So I, I don't want to quote you the wrong number, but uh, the, adding the two additional tanks gets you pretty well out of that 80% range. And Mike Curry with my firm probably has that number more readily. We never sized, uh, in terms of those aeration tanks, we never went through a full sizing of them, but it brought you above the yeah. much further above. I think it was 30 or 40%. And I believe, and this is in the report, uh, it brought us above that 30, uh, 2037 build out. Yep. We had capacity for the projection. future, for the next planning period. I know we have a lot of area in town that still doesn't have sewer. And as we move forward, part of that area is pretty well developed. Mm -hmm. Exeter Road, there's still a lot of open space. You get on Toll Farm, Mary Bachelor Road, that, that part of it is pretty well built out. And those systems are out there old and failing. So we're gonna, at some point in time, we're gonna have to address at least doing that part of town. Right? And I got no problem making sure that we, you know, we, we take care of the system, but I wanna make sure that it would be able to handle that waste if we have to do something out there. It yeah. would be if the town, you know, but that's contingent upon the town putting up another five, 10 million to run sewer lines and possibly a pump station out there. So, I mean, that's a whole but, other. Oh, it's a whole like, other, no, whole other venue. But I want to make right. sure yeah. that what we're doing now has the ability to take that. Yes. Because it's not, it's not if we ever do it. It's when we do it. Right. We need to make sure that that area, you know, is going to be, because as I said, the systems that are out there are old and failing. Where are they going? Taylor River. Well, that's and part of the uh, the problem that we're sure. facing is. I can remember reading when I first got here the prior facility study, and it talked about how the beach was, would, you know, and the same question, well, how far can this current plant go? And the, it's I found it almost a humorous line. They said um, under the present zoning uh, in the beach area, the beach, beach district, uh, the maximum density is seven units per acre, and there it was based upon heights and setbacks and things of that nature. My calculations over the last four years show that we're building out the beach at almost 120 units per acre. Far in excess of what this plant or any plant was, was designed for. So more so than, and you're right, the west side of the town's gonna, its day is gonna come, but what's already here is we are actively building out the beach and, and, and going to exceed the capacity of this station in a short, and we also got to make Period sure we time. address those other issues of infiltration sure. down there on, on the beach and in other parts of town, mm -hmm. which we know we're having, as, as, yeah. as uh, Mr. Preston uh, alluded to. No, he's, he's correct. Absolutely. Yep. So, thank you. Yep. Rick. Well, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> all through the years when different things were coming up about these condominiums and that, we were assured there were plenty of capacity and that this wasn't going to happen, that what you're saying is happening now. Um, so all of a sudden, everyone looked at it differently before. So I think there must be some uh, medium that's uh, not as dire as what you're suggesting. The change is twofold. If there hadn't been the rule change in 2014, and we were still just talking about a number of gallons per day, we we're not banging our heads against the ceiling. But when they added in the rules, or changed the rules in 2014, to now look at BOD statewide, the ceiling got a lot closer. Mm -hmm. And that combination with the amount of growth we've had over the last three years is really, is what's really driving us. Salinity, yes, it does mess with our, I, I call it the cake mix. The cake <coughs> mix ingredients are changing hourly. As the tide comes in, we see the salinity go through the roof. Uh, not through the roof, but a market increase. Um, when the tide comes in, we see our infiltration go up dramatically. Uh, these kinds of things are what, the combination of all of them is what's driving this. Mm -hmm. It isn't strictly just one. So uh, if phase one is roughly 13, what was it, 13? 13.8. Uh, so how long is it going to take to uh, use that money and how long will it take to make sure that's been utilized? So, so, so it would be based upon that schedule that you had. So I can the better time. understand the question. How long would it take to design and then construct the improvements associated with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, how, how long is that going to take? 
for you to use that money? Yeah, so we can, we can for the schedule we laid out here briefly, it, it, it was uh, designing it in 2018 and constructing it in 2019 to 2020. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so it would be finished by 2020? Yeah, to, the phase one could be largely completed within a couple of years. Three years. years. Yeah. So what happens if the uh, voters don't support for phase two? Is, are there a lot, is it a finished uh, package? So phase one is a discrete upgrade to deal with the immediate high priority needs and also some of the capacity con issues as well. So that's the immediate? That's the, yeah. And then phase two, those projects become more and more immediate as we get further down the road. They'll be, they'll be more necessary, but they're not, phase one will do its job and then phase two can come after that. So ideally, when would you like to see phase two begin? So we gave that a five-year window from 2022, from 2020 to 2025. That's the window in which we recommend that phase two be undertaken and completed. Okay, thank and, you. So I envision, I'm 58 now, I envision when I'm 63, I'll be sitting in this room having a similar discussion about phase two. Yeah, I've been sitting here for 12 years and it's all, it's very similar. All. Everything yep. that's been brought up here has been brought up over and over and over again. Yep. And, I, and, I, and I think in the past, we've been able to, through wise management, through uh, nursing the plan along, through the operator, operators themselves, doing some very unique things in a day-in, day-out basis, along with some guidance from Wright Pierce and others. Uh, we've been able to nurse it along, but uh, we're calling it out days of nursing them longer. They've expired. Thank you. Phil? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you uh, for your presentation tonight. And uh, I've read the uh, source document, the Wright Pierce Wastewater Facilities Plan for the Town of New Hampshire, September 2017. Uh, Director, was there a, a prior wastewater facilities plan? There was. The ones that uh, we last read, and um, matter of fact, I asked Mike to probably go back and compare for me in the previous facility study what things were called for then, and are they called for here? And they are. Aeration lagoons were primary. Uh, odor control within the plant, the condition of what the, the staff have to work with. Um, sludge uh, disposal, how we manage sludge. We use a lot of plant water when we receive sludge or, or septage from people's septic systems because we continually have to turn it. We just keep adding more water to it. It's like a blender with a hose in it. Uh, it's the best analogy I can make. So we... In what year was that last study? 2006. Six, right. And one before that was like 1984. Okay. And how much different is this study than the 2006 study and uh, this, this is for the engineer is much more complete yeah. mm -hmm. much more um, uh, literally item by item detailed I, I mean I've seen their spreadsheet where they came up with this the number of items in the spreadsheet is just astounding um, for them to you know looking at the different parts and pieces uh, so this has been a much more complete study much more uh, focused and defined and on that last study, how much uh, work, how much money was invested uh, by the town to uh, satisfy some of those needs from the 2006 study ballpark, if any? I would say two to maybe four million. I mean, I know that, correct me if I'm wrong, right, the head, some head works projects were done. Uh, new dewatering uh, uh, press fair. was put in in 2012 when I got here. Um, so yeah, some of the stuff has been done. but. Uh, the bigger items like the new aeration lagoon and the odor control within the plant, uh, you know, we've done things like, because I know we've sat here before, put in new fans and blow air around more often. Uh, you know, we, we kind of, we won't, we don't joke about it, but if you take a brand new copper penny and lay it on Mike's desk or anywhere inside the plant, it is totally corroded like a 50-year-old penny, two days to three days. That's the air quality within the plant. Well, that same corrosion works on the computers that are in there, all the electrical connections that are in there, everything. Yeah, thank you for that. And and more importantly, it's uh, working on Mike. And uh, I'm very concerned about uh, the health effects for the Mendano. I know the board is. I know Mr. Welch is. I know you are. 
and uh, simply sitting next to an electrical panel uh, down there, Michael, is, is not uh, good for your health. And uh, breathing um, those fumes is, is not good. And if it's doing that to a penny, I can only imagine what it's doing to human flesh. So uh, that, that is a, a serious concern. I am not an expert on this. I have read the document. I have some questions. I did a little, little bit of research. I will reference the meeting that we went to um, in Concord. You were there. Mr. Welch was there. Other department heads were there, um, and the speaker uh, mentioned value enterprise systems, uh, and uh, they have instituted that in Hudson. I know that's on your radar, and I know that you've got a lot of other things going on, uh, and particularly the speaker, and, and there'll be a new speaker soon, uh, mentioned that he was sensitive to the, to the infrastructure cost that Hampton bears correct Mr. Welch, in support of about 3% of the revenue for the general fund that comes out of this town. And it's an extraordinary amount. We heard of a $30 million pension obligation last week. We heard about a 50 to $60 million depreciation uh, factor that you've identified some of that in this report. And it's a huge, huge um, amount. And it seems like every stone we turn, we look at uh, two other municipalities that are, are, are getting a free ride. They don't, they don't have this cost. Um, so th there's uh, a lot of consideration to running this platform. And uh, these uh, are not uh, cries in the night uh, that should be in vain, but taxpayers uh, really need support of the state, and funding will be important. I'll, I'll just have a couple of comments, if I may, please, Mr. Chairman. Uh, don't expect the answers, but perhaps to orient um, future um, actions and uh, what I might uh, be looking for as a taxpayer and as a, an elected leader in the town. Uh, the um, industrial factor where uh, the load concentrations and those types of um, challenges to the system with those limits. And, and another important point of this is, is that it's actually affecting our capability for future growth. Correct. So the performance Correct. of existing businesses that really aren't paying for this, the true share, um, they're also um, exponentially uh, taking up future investment, future capacity. And I, I thought that was a salient in this uh, report that um, I had never thought of, I didn't know of, and I, and I think that's a huge consideration um, for this town. Um, the uh, matter of industrial surcharge fees. We've got folks in the back of the room tonight talking about huge problems um, with their um, uh, challenges with, are essentially I and I issues, and when it, it, it leaves their property, it goes into your system. Would that be correct? Yeah. Yeah, so then that's a huge problem you've identified here. So again, by the very nature of, of where we are geographically, it presents a serious challenge. We talked about the depreciation schedule and conformance with GASPA. You, you're on this page here that uh, the integrity of the system to remain that ongoing integrity is about 800000 to $1.6 million per year. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that is money that in 12 years we've spent 2 or $3 million, but according to statistical analysis here, and there's folks with water, and now they're saying people are actually paying attention, um, we're not funding and securing um, those true costs and identifying that. Um, page, uh, well, there's a graph before 2-4, and it's about the influent flow event frequency, and sometimes that that plan is amazingly taxed. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on what you've said, uh, it's amazing that it works. Up to 13 million gallons a day, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an incredible, mm -hmm. incredible, in yeah. incredible. And I'll get into that rate thing on uh, 2-11. And, and concurrently, as we move forward with this actual expenditure of dollars, I think concurrently uh, it, it's prudent uh, to develop a more sophisticated, realistic rate uh, fee, rate charge, and, and, and do those things and not wait. And, and, and actually, it certainly can be done. <clears throat> you, you folks, I know you're going to drive that, and I know you're going to do that. But it specifically calls apply an industrial surcharge fee for industrial users uh, in treating the higher concentration waste streams. So that's in there. That's important. Um, again, the Hampton Beach I&I &I, um, uh, issues will, will be addressed. Um, again, we don't assess any type of loading surcharge um, for permit holders. The 
high concentration industrial users have a significant effect not only on the overall facility, but also on the potential future development in the town sewer system. So these, uh, these have broad and wide-ranging um, implications besides um, fiscal um, ramifications. And just to read, um, do, you, do you have the um, enterprise funds? I gave you the five copies I have. Could you I just read, please, because it's your department, um, what I have highlighted here and there, just so the public could understand what you're trying to get to. Thank you. What we, when, about a year ago, when we went, saw the Speaker of the House, uh, what he <coughs> recommended or suggested to us is we get in line with basically 98% of the rest of the communities in the state and operate our wastewater water, if we had water, uh, through an enterprise fund, meaning that you you set rates that cover your operational costs, but not only that, your current uh, debt that you're carrying for the plant, and you recognize like situations like this, what your future needs are gonna be, and you actually um, ramp up your rates to cover Pre, pre the early development costs, the engineering, financial things of, of, of putting in these new things. So what is an enterprise fund? It's an enterprise fund is considered the best practice to promote and maintain long-term financial sustainability for water, sewer, and stormwater activities. An enterprise fund is a separate accounting and financial reporting mechanism for which revenues and expenditures are segregated and will fund with financial statements from other government activities. Uh, in, in common language, it means uh, you know, on your taxing, taxed for based upon the, your building value, you're taxed, you're sent a bill based upon your actual usage or your potential usage. Um, direct costs can generally consist of uh, personnel, services, expenses, capital outlay, and our budget and account afford in the fund, indirect cost or expenditures budgeted and accounted for in the general fund on behalf of the enterprise fund. Um, and it goes on to you know basically say uh, certain things are covered, certain things are not covered. But it is another fair and equitable funding mechanism that takes it off the, purely off the tax base. So that um, we were discussing earlier, if uh, uh, Tim's in, in touch with another community that has a similar situation that we do. They're a ski community. So they have nobody there during the week, but during the weekends, during the ski, the, the, the flow is huge. Well, even, so the people that have the ski chalets or the ski condos, they actually pay a service fee because we maintain the plan or keep that plan open for them 24 hours a day, every day of the year, waiting for them to come up there. We just can't not have the plan available. Well, that's some of the same things that we experience here. We, you, you build and we maintain a uh, four million gallon per day plant. Today's flows, from, they, I looked at the report just before I came over, they hovered at two million gallons for the last two weeks. So we're using right now half of the plant, but the reason why we have such a big plant and why it needs to be bigger is the influx in the summer, and that's that's why you have what you have. Thank you, okay. Director. And just a couple more things, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, I did some research on some other water uh, treatment facilities, some other districts. And again, I think these are, are concurrent uh, exigencies that must be met in addition to uh, um, business as usual, which is just replace, replace, and replace. Uh, but again, to the um, uh, funding mechanism that we're, I know you're going to explore all those, but I was uh, in a uh, uh, down south, there's a j daily rate per equivalent dwelling unit, there's fixed monthly charges for sewer system capital projects, there's a block sewer rate, and without getting into the details, I know Tim and uh, Mike and, and Mr. Welch, I know all of you are familiar with this, and I, I think it's imperative uh, that we um, start uh, looking at this now. Um, I looked at California um, and some of their uh, drought uh, challenges, and if you use water past a certain time, there's rate surcharges that are steep. There's, uh, like any uh, utility, electric, uh, you can get prime time charges. So I think we need to get much more sophisticated and take this burden off the taxpayers. And the users uh, and the ones that perhaps enjoy profits from their business um, 
basically, um, that's that's a, a cost they're not paying right now. Correct. And, and uh, I looked at um, uh, in the Eastern Municipal Water District, I believe it's in Tennessee, um, they publish the annual costs associated with environmental and regulatory requirements. And we're concerned about that, of what new regulatory, and Tim's nodding his head, all of you are, when they pass laws, um, that they're good laws, but they do cost money to comply with. So I've, I've said enough, I don't need answers to those, but uh, I think that the funding mechanism outside of bonding and warrant articles in this value enterprise system is uh, the way to go and get much more creative. And finally, one last thing is um, going forward uh, in terms of recycled water. And uh, time passes quickly. What are we doing with some of those uh, options? And we, we get uh, really uh, progressive in terms of what this plant is going to be. So when we're investing the type these types of money. We just don't look to the, the, the depreciation factor, but we come up with some game plan where we can move the chains and we can actually get environmentally uh, sophisticated and for, for applications that uh, um, can use that, some recycled water um, options. Thank you, Tim, Mike. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think the whole town should thank all of you guys for the good job you do down there and keeping that together and keeping it working the way it does. I think you've done a phenomenal job, so thank you. Uh, I read the report, too. I read it once, then I read it twice, then I looked at it another time, and I only had one word, and you deal with it down there. <laughs> that was my impression. Uh, the enterprise thing, I think, is a great idea. It always amazed me how we didn't pay for what we use here. It's crazy. Uh, you know, when you go to the doctor, the doctor always asks you in pain, how is it on a scale of 1 to 10? On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you put the critical need here? I'll so, put number one for the first phase. For the for the phase one upgrade, I would say it's easily an 8 or a 9. 8 or a 9. And there's stuff there that is really, you've gotten your money's worth out of. And yeah. it's ran longer than it would have at many other plants. Yeah. And I, I think all of us realize that. I think you realize it, but I think we really got to get that out to the town and make sure that they realize that, it, that it's up that high. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, it's a great report, and, and, you know, is this the best way to do it? You know, is there any other way to do it? Is this the best approach that we're taking? Is I think the best approach is facing it head on, determining as a community what we can realistically afford to do, and then doing it. Um, the shocker is to read the 2006 or the 84 report and realize in dollars and cents then what, what you'd think today is pretty inexpensive. I realize in 84 or 2006 it probably was on a parallel as expensive. But this type of work will never get less expensive. And it can't fail, right? There's, you, you don't have that option. Right. We don't have an option to let the, right to let this plant to let it fail. Yeah. Right. I mean, you have, you know, if you're buying into those those lagoons, and let's say aeration lagoons, they cost five million dollars. It's not like uh, buying a boat and just throwing water in it. It it truly becomes an asset of the town that works for the town every single day. Um, and it's the same thing with the, the other processes, the headworks, the um, all of them combined together. They all work for the town 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I was amazed to see on one of my plant inspections, we went down and I said to Mike, why is this grease coming out of this, this one bearing assembly? And we're in the, we're in the headworks and it's, there's three pumps in there. Um, I think Chicago, I want to say they come from Chicago. Mm -hmm. They've been in since 1974, the motors and the pumps that the, that the motors spin. We take them out every, we had to take this one pump out in the last two years to have the seals rebuilt because that was the grease that I saw. Those are the same pumps that have been in place since 1974. On a daily basis, two out of three are always running. Can you imagine having a car in your dooryard that since 1974 has been running nonstop? And during the summer, we need all three pumps because at times, like when everybody leaves the beach and before they go out to dinner, the flow into the plant is incredible. It's a peak time. You need all three pumps. Um, I'm sitting there looking at an antique. 
was in 74. I was just, you know, was a freshman in high school. Oh my God, this is amazing. And this thing is still, they're still running. They're, they're, but if he called me in the middle of the night and said one of them just literally died, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right, it died. So that's what we're facing. We're facing some uh, a very original equipment in here that uh, I'm amazed still still works. And parts of it have been replaced, though, as you went yeah, we, along. Like, that, when were the paddles done there that were done that were reconstructed in Canada? Oh, the, 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 I think you mean the Fournier Press, and we got yeah, a new what Fournier year Press. was that? Uh, about 2012, it got installed. And that was in response to the sewer moratorium with the solids issue. So the, the just the sludge dewatering equipment part of it was upgraded to 2012. And that was like, how much money was that then? 1.3 million. The, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is, uh, are you planning on doing a presentation for the planning committee? Oh, definitely. The planning we'll, we'll committee. I'll go to the home. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's really important. And and the other thing is, the uh, the indust industries. And I know you're keeping a close eye on that. You know that that we see something in the paper, and then all of a sudden we have, and they say, no, that's not true. And right. yeah, but and, I mean, and, you know, we don't consider. They're part of the economic engine that is Hampton. Right. So um, we treat them with respect, and we treat them with we want to work with you because if you're successful, we're successful. It's it's a very symbiotic relationship. But, it, but at some point, there's only so much BOD we can handle, and but, they recognize that, and they've been working with us. Right. Uh, they've been actually hauling some of their higher strength waste away. So um, I mean, that's why you saw the six <coughs> on the the bar chart that you saw when we hit peaked at 15 and you saw 16 lower, it was due to some efforts between all of us in this room working with them and they did their part to lower their BOD. And so we you know, we, we knew we had to take some steps to keep it in, in check. We've been working at that, but you can only keep doing it just right. so long. And everybody has to pay their fair share. Exactly. I mean, you got to treat everybody with respect, but everybody also has to pay their fair share. So and is it easy important. enough to do to, uh, like, how people bring water in and then how they release it. I mean, can you base the fees that might be charged in the future on what the people's water bill is? So that's how a number of communities do it now, based on your water meter. So in, in Hampton's case, we'd have to get that information from Aquarian on a house-by-house -house basis, but that's what other you know private water companies do. Yeah, because a lot of people look at businesses and they think, oh my God, businesses, they should pay more. They're using so much more water, when in reality, many businesses don't use a lot of water. True. I know I have a hair salon, and everyone always says, oh, how much water do you use? My water bill is small. It doesn't, it is not near as big as a, a family with four people living in it. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone doesn't use the same amount of water. Uh, residential, mm -hmm. I believe, in many cases, uses more than many, many businesses. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to look at it like that. And right. what, what type of a schedule would we be on for that, Mr. Welch, where we would we start working on something like that? Well, there are various type schedules that could take that into consideration. But what would our timing be to fit in with? We're probably talking a year to a year and a half to get the entire thing done and then we have to figure out once that's done uh, whether or not the town will accept it because we probably need to go to a public hearing then we need to go to town meeting for a vote. So. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Just so, somebody brought up a point to me at one point and, I, and I, I think we really should look at this but if they're paying a fee for the pseudo user fee yeah. how does that work with, their ta with paying taxes? Well, they're paying the fee and you're a residential customer, uh, you no longer get to deduct that from your federal income taxes. Businesses would get to deduct it because it's a business expense. Right. But if, if you pay it through your taxes, you can deduct that as a That's as correct. A, as yeah. part of your thing. But if you're paying it as just paying it as a bill, yeah. you don't get to do that. No. It, it, and, and you have to make that comparison when you do this. You also have to make the comparison of what would be your rate based upon your consumption on a billing rate versus what it is in a tax rate? So if you're if it's costing you, if your tax bill is five thousand dollars, I'm just using a, an example, and you figure out your sewer cost, which is the biggest chunk of change you pay in the town government, not the schools and so forth, but the town, 
you may end up paying, uh, for instance, $1,000 for your sewer cost overall because of the value of your home, but if you had it on a billing rate, you may only be paying $500. So in essence, you get a decrease in your, your, your tax load, plus it would come off your property taxes. And the people that are out, outside the sewer district won't be paying anything. Then they shouldn't be, because they're receiving absolutely zero services. And all taxes may be deducted out of the new uh, plan. Yeah, that they're sorry, that could very well be. You don't, you don't know. Mm -hmm. Plan of taxes, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else, guys? Do you guys have anything else you'd like to go over with us, or only that you know? I know, I know it's not necessarily a vote, but if you approve of the basically the plan that we want to go, and that is to, um, I know it has to go through a warrant article, but that we want to. Do a lot of community outreach we want to do something for channel 22 and if you're supportive of that in other words continue on the direction that we're going i'll make the motion i'll second it okay that that we the motion is that we support your efforts in going forward with phase one Correct. or the whole plan phase one phase, phase one. one okay phase one. Right. and uh that, 13 whatever it's 13 a is that uh, Mr. Welch put together a draft of the warrant article at $15 million because, to be honest with you, this is like digging in this old house, and we may come up with a, a rotten sill or a, an electrical panel that we didn't realize was also... Sticker heavy. shock means a lot in this town. Right. Okay. I, I understand. So Okay. All right. So all in favor? May, may oh, I just have uh, sure. a little discussion, Mr. Chairman? And uh, I, I would uh, certainly support that wholeheartedly, and, and y you thought it was a good idea, uh, perhaps others, but uh, that they incorporate some of these... Uh, um, uh, value enterprise systems, uh, some of these uh, more progressive water uses, the rate charges, the yep. industrial charge. If we can make that part of your presentation as well. Thank you. So if we incorporate that, thank you. Mr. Excellent. Chairman. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Thank I you wouldn't mind going on a tour either. I've done it yeah. before, but if it could be on a Monday, hopefully. That's, that's yeah. fine with us. I think yeah. it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I would, why don't, um, any day, we're at your service, so any, I mean, we operate 20 percent. Always works Why don't you best for collectively me. through the uh, manager's office let us know what day or dates are available and for all of you and, and if it means three in one day and two in another. Either uh, early or late. We're there, you know, seven thirty to three thirty. Well, he's three thirty. Five, seven. <laughs> yeah. We were there. Nine, yeah. ten, eleven. I think early in the morning would be good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, thank you. Approval of minutes, October 30th, 2017. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. Regina? Second. Second by Rusty. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, approval of minutes, November 2nd, 2017. I'll make a motion. Regina? All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, town manager's report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, commencing this Wednesday, November 15th, there is no on-street parking between 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. on any street in the town of Hampton. Please find alternate parking to avoid the possibility of receiving a parking ticket, which we really don't want our police handing out. Leaf pickup is in progress. Pickup routes are based upon your trash and recycling pickup dates. Please have your leaves placed in a biodegradable paper bag or in a trash barrel loosely packed and placed at the curb for pickup. No sticks, brush, or logs. And let me comment a little further on that because we have people placing in their leaves with their trash. Leaves being deposited with the trash is against both state and federal law, and they're going to the landfill uh, to be to be landfilled, and that's a violation of statute. So it should go in a separate container, not your regular trash container, an old barrel, a, a plastic tub, whatever you have. Uh, to hold those leaves so they can be picked up and put in the back of the vehicle. That's important, but do not put it in with your regular trash. That is a problem for us, and it's also a problem for the landfill. Petition warrant articles for zoning can be accepted at the Selectman's Office starting on Monday, November 13th. Happens to be today uh, through December 13th. Uh, of course, petition warrant articles for anything else can be accepted anytime up until uh, uh, January, I believe it's January 9th. Uh, and that's it, Mr. Chairman. We're pretty good this week. Questions? Okay. Rusty. All set. One thing I have, and this has to do with you, Fred, about uh, the letter 
that you got from John Diane about the transportation grant and William Rose is going to produ uh, provide an update on grant process and the recommendations on steps that include a new series of public hearings. Yep. Do you know anything about that? I don't. I haven't received any information whatsoever from the state. I have in the past scheduled three separate appointments with the Department of Transportation and all three were canceled. Yeah, I think that, you know, we need to know uh, and, and we need to be able to grab a hold of this. Plus, I'd like also th somehow that there'll be uh, both the state and the Hampton Area Commission know about what our situation is regarding the new bridge that might be happening. Yes. In the past, everything started here at the Board of Selectmen. I agree. And I think that we should let them know that, uh, you know, they are there to uh, to advise us or whatever, but the Board of Selectmen needs to have their hands on what's happening at the bridge. I don't disagree with you at all, sir. And I, as you know, I sent a letter to the State Department of Transportation last week on behalf of the board and on behalf of the town asking them to uh, increase the speed at which they're operating. We want to be involved in this process. It's very important to us and to not have to replace that bridge until 2023. It is the worst bridge in the state of New Hampshire and is dangerous in itself by being in that category. So I'd like to continue working with DOT to try to find out what they're doing and why they're doing it and bring that to the board. It is an advisory committee, isn't it? The Hampton Area Commission? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, because I hear more happening about the bridge there than I do here, and yep. I think that's wrong. Well, I agree with you, and that's why we've tried to hold meetings with the state, but that's been, with the exception of the, the hearing they came into last week to advise you about the emergency repairs, we've had virtually nothing. It's the same way with uh, Ocean Boulevard, we'd like to see that approved. We'd like to see that taken care of. Uh, I have had several meetings scheduled with state DOT, and all of them just shortly before the meeting have been canceled, and, and I'm not able to arrange any new meetings. So I will continue to try, and we will continue to try to get on the docket and get this thing settled. Thank it you. needs to be done. Phil? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Welch, uh, I know there's been some uh, interest about uh, safety on the conservation uh, area on Mill Road with uh, weapons. Yes, sir. And uh, would you care to discuss that now, later? I, I, I know I am very concerned about long rifles being used there. There is no uh, range there. It is not a range. Uh, no, it's and, not a range. And uh, we have, uh, I, I think, a, a life-threatening uh, condition there. And uh, could you uh, extrapolate on the way forward on that, please? Well, let's say that it's, um, <clears throat> there seems to be folks who are using a piece of town property for the purpose of practicing with firearms. Some of it is occurring at night. It can be dangerous. Uh, we are in the process of working with the chief of police uh, and the former chief of police, who's the deputy town manager, and working up a proposition that will come before this board for approval uh, through the Conservation Commission. They're working diligently on this, and they're almost finished. And they will have a policy to bring, I believe, to your next meeting for your review and approval so that we can have some general groundwork and some general rules with regards to use of this property. Uh, I, I haven't seen what they're doing yet, but I understand they're concerned about the exact same thing. So I think you're going to find that what they're doing is, my understanding is, is very comprehensive. It's very important for them to control this because it is the property that they control, not us. Uh, and they want to work diligently with the selectmen to get this resolved quickly. And Thanks. wasn't someone just killed in another town? Yes, yes, there, there was. was, and yeah. uh, I understand the legal right and the weapons and the Second Amendment and all that stuff. However, uh, and I understand there's conservation and there's got to be the application of law and that we don't violate anyone's rights. Right. Many of these people are coming from out of town. You yeah. can hear this. I've been around a, a, a range or two in my life, and uh, your, your ears pick They're up. tuned. And uh, some of some of the uh, when you hear it, it's alarming, 
And uh, we know when our police and law enforcement are using our range, that that's a range. Um, is there something we can do uh, as far as uh, instituting a procedure, and I'm not stepping on the police chief's traffic, that when we do hear that um, those rounds going off, that we do roll uh, a cruiser down there and uh, we maintain safety for our residents. I saw pictures today, quite frankly, uh, with people with long rifles. Uh, there were several of them. Uh, there was no protective gear. There were people in front of the weapons. There were people in back of the weapons. You could just tell that these people, they were very young. Uh, and it, it, it was a very dangerous, dangerous situation. Can we do anything to that effect? Uh, without passing, I believe, an ordinance, we have very little that we can do. Uh, there are some general rules of the state of New Hampshire about firing firearms within a certain number of feet of occupied dwellings. If that's an infraction and we can show that's an infraction, the police department will be arresting people and taking weapons away. Uh, we don't want to have to go there. Uh, but then again, we don't want to have to have these kinds of noise in the evening either or after dark, and this, some of this is going on after dark. Uh, we, we believe there should be some control, and our review indicates there's probably on the basis of a town-wide warrant article to, in fact, ban certain activities during certain times. Again, not to ban hunting or anything like that, but uh, to ban the, the regular use of firearms around the clock uh, on town property. Particularly in the town forest, which most of this property is up there, is a town forest. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Manager. Just a, a quick thing. Uh, I'm going back to my old hunting days. I believe everything east of 125 is limited to shotgun only because of, as you say, the long rifles carry that far. Oh, they're, they're quite and a distance. So I, I, I would think that, you know, our ordinance should at least cover something like that, be in line with what the hunting ordinance is. Whatever the hunting statute is will be incorporated therein. So if people are firing long rifles in restricted areas, that's just not acceptable. Um, sir, 15th, the parking ban was into effect. Yes, sir. Charlie had come in with a suggestion. You were going to talk to the police and the DPW about the plowing and stuff, whether the town lot could be open for people? I've asked them to review that. I believe that's going to be accomplished Okay. when it snows. Okay. So they'll, that they'll, all depends upon the following schedule and, and, and but they'll put notice out to that effect or yes, I mean, so people will be aware of that that they can park there yes as it is right now they can park there during snow emergencies so they don't have to be on the street right so when it snows people can obviously park there yeah. uh, he, he wanted to arrange it so they would use either one side of the lot on, yeah. a, on an even day and the other side of yeah. the lot on an odd day and we're trying to work that out okay all that right. requires some logistical uh, assortment of Okay. Anything else? The town manager? Okay. Uh, Warren articles, draft Warren articles. We, Mr. Chairman, we have a few. Yeah, we have a few. We have a few. Uh, I, given uh, the presentation that was made just a few minutes ago uh, by our consulting engineers, I took the liberty of going through and itemizing all of the warrant articles that are currently available to us. I'll pass these out. If we if we look at the total, including the fifteen million dollars that was talked of and the uh, that includes everything that the uh, draft warrant article is, is under consideration for. Um, there's a total of $29,042,605 contained in these articles. Um, total warrant articles recommended was $22,462,520. Total to be raised by taxes is $1,504,699. And the total to be used for unassigned fund balance is $200,000. The total for special revenue funds is $221,814, and the total for, from state funds is $316,231, and the total for bonding is $17,500,000. Basically, this represents a cut from this year of $2,046,361 decrease on the number of warrant articles to be recommended to be approved. 
Um, when we're looking at bonding items of this large, we know that two years down the road, we're going to we're going to have a kick in of that material for taxes. And uh, for a fifteen million dollar bond article, that represents uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in principal per year, and in the first year, twenty eight thousand seven hundred dollars in interest at the current rate of bonding at the municipal bond bank, which is very nice. I'd like to find some borrowing myself at 2.67 percent, but that's what it turns out to be. So uh, as I go down through these, I'm going. you'll note that on the chart there are zeros besides those things that we're not recommending. The Church Street Force Main it was $4,242,000 recommended zero. Bicentennial Seawall is estimated at $2,500,000 uh, for replacement, subject to the receipt of uh, the bids that are currently out, but that's the estimate. That's recommended. The wastewater treatment plant bond of $15 million. That represents $17,500,000 in future obligations, not in this particular year. Non-money articles, uh, the all-service veterans credit, the harbor dredging and restoration article, which is more a federal uh, and state item, Keno, election of officers, and zoning articles, of which we will believe, believe there'll be from seven to eight of those articles. Uh, annual appropriation articles, which are done every single year, uh, recommending conservation land acquisition fund at $20,000, which is the same as each year. The household has its waste collection, which in the past has been 15000 We're recommending 10000 because we've been underspending that sum this year and the year before. Uh, the human service agencies, right, and we're still waiting for one to come in, are currently at $171,475. Uh, the highway block grant. Uh, had originally been pegged at $565,001, recommending that only the state portion, $316,231, be used and no town funds be appropriated for that. Uh, the Police Forfeiture Special Revenue Fund is $90,000, of which no funding is, is, is tax-based. DPW of Vehicle Purchases of $522,000. Recreation Infrastructure Special Revenue Fund, that's repairs to recreation facilities, is $131,814. The Road Improvement Capital Reserve Fund, which we do every single year, is $300,000 from taxes. Sidewalks, $50,000 from taxes. Fire Department Pickup Truck, $51,000 from taxes. That's a net total of, uh, of all the articles is $1,916,290. Uh, recommended to be appropriate is one million one two four four seven five. Uh, as we go over to construction appropriation articles, we have the five corners intersection improvements at six hundred thousand dollars. Recommend zero. Sewer aeration basin and clarifier rebuilds two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Recommend zero because it's in the fifteen million. Uh, maintenance of historic structures twenty thousand dollars. Those sums to be taken from uh, surplus or on unassigned fund balance. Uh, Molten Road Sewer Replacement, $131,700, recommend zero. Tuck Field Offices and Storage, $675,000, recommend zero. Replace Highway DPW Garage Lighting, $30,000, recommend zero. Lock Road Sewer Replacement, $337,615, recommend zero. Replace solid waste compact of $60,000, recommend zero. Now, of those, the uh, highway lighting, uh, talking to the DPW director, he's going to take gradually out of the uh, funds that are available in the highway budget. And the solid waste compactor of $60,000, we're looking at the end of the year and hope that we'll be able to bring in sufficient funds left over in the highway budget to purchase that this year with the board's permission. So it would not be there next year. So the total construction appropriation articles represent that was submitted represent two million one hundred and four thousand three hundred and fifteen dollars. We recommend the total to be appropriated from taxes to be zero, and the total from the unassigned fund balance to be twenty thousand dollars. Lease purchase equipment. Uh, the fire department has requested a tower bucket ladder truck. 
uh, over a five-year lease purchase, which is $1,500,000, and would be a, a lease purchase annually of $280,224. Articles paid from unreserved fund balance, beach street lighting, $100,000, that's a continuation of a prior program. Total to be appropriated from taxes, zero. Total from the unassigned fund balance, $100,000. <coughs> so there's no tax impact. Our study articles and engineering articles, uh, study town flooding issues, $100,000. That's an appropriation item. King's Highway drainage system, uh, and that's for engineering design, $80,000 recommended to be funded from the unass unassigned fund balance. So the total of those articles is, is $180,000. The total to be appropriated is $100,000. Funds from Capital Reserve, reconstruction of a portion of Lafayette Road, $1,500,000. To be appropriated from taxes, zero. We have $1,500,000 in the in, uh, Capital Reserve Fund, which would pay for that. So the total amount for all of that to be from appropriated from taxes would be $1,504,699 down from this year of $3,551,060. That's kind of our analysis of what we'd like to recommend to the board for your consideration. A lot of work. Good job. It is a lot of work. Um, I think it's a great, great job, Fred. Um, I just have, um, obviously, the wastewater treatment plant, I see the necessity of it. It's scary. It's oh, it unsafe is. conditions for workers. And if they say, and it can't fail, but you know what keeps help? What if one of those things stops spinning or something? It's very. It's a huge item. It needs to. It needs to be done. But fifteen million dollars, big. It is. So but it's based upon a forty-one million dollar principal and interest cost to do it all. Right. So. Are we gonna? Do you think is the board ready to vote on these bonds tonight? No. Okay. Oh, I don't so. think so. No. All right. Um, but yeah, I think this analysis that you've done has uh, proven <coughs> that you are trying to uh, eliminate as much as the tax burden for this uh, upcoming town meeting we have, and it's an excellent job. And we just can't be all things to all people all the time. Right. I mean. I, uh, I know that we need to do, for instance, uh, the Molten Road and the Lock Road uh, sewer replacement. Both of them are um, obsolete sewer lines and they need to be replaced. But frankly, if I can't process the sewerage right. at the plant, I can't very well afford to get it there. So I've got, I had to make the decision of which one comes first, the chicken or the egg. Right. I guess the egg came first in this case. Hopefully that's right. That was my, my question exactly. I mean, you, you look at all the ones under the construction appropriation articles that you, that you recommend zero on, and and I don't disagree with you. I think before we start going out and doing all this stuff that is going to need to be done eventually, right. we need to make sure that where it's going has the ability to accept it. It's kind so of the bottom you, line. you got to start someplace, and I think starting at the plant is correct. Rick? You know, I think we have to just fine-tune these figures a little bit. Oh, yeah. 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 These are just first glance, give you something to, to work with. Uh, not to say that these are final recommendations. Uh, you're right. You need to think about them. You need to think about the consequences of each one. And you need to come up with your best decision, knowing what's going on in the community, which the board does, of what needs to be accomplished for the benefit of everyone in the town. At the same time, trying to balance the tax rate so everybody can continue to afford it and in the long run pay for the improvements we have to do. <coughs> Phil? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Welsh, thanks for that uh, orientation uh, and that data. Uh, very nice job. And it's interesting to look at last year's warrant. There were um, 24 money articles on the warrant, 19 passed, 5 failed including uh, the, the big uh, four sewer main, which we see again this year. Uh, interestingly, we had four union contracts that were on the ballot last year. Three failed and one was passed. 
So it's interesting to go back and look at that. We will have some union contracts. At least three. We'll have three coming up on that uh, again this year, certainly the three that uh, didn't make it last year. So that historical perspective is important. And we had talked about um, the analysis with finance. We had talked about Plodznik, uh kind of plussing up their contract. I know that's that's imminent. And then we can um, better educate the public, warn the public about what this looks like, and actually do that that graph of how our tax rate looks like over the future. Uh, incorporate that into our uh, current bond schedule. And I, I think an educated public, um, as generous as they were last year, um, not so much for the three contracts that didn't get approved for the union folks, but um, 19 to 5 is a pretty, pretty good success rate. Plus, they did a, a school. Um, so um, they were, the, the taxpayers invested in themselves quite a bit. And with this new uh, public works, with our GASPI, and an education process as part of that, I'm looking forward to that. Plodznik input, if I think the board had a consensus on that. And then we look at that data. We share that with the budget committee. Um, and the budget committee gets plussed up, and we get much more scientific about it. And your, your contribution tonight was a very good start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It, it, it's a good report, and it's a good thing. I have a couple of questions. Certainly. No, human service agencies. Yes. Were we requiring them to, to give us an update on uh, on how that money is spent and stuff? I mean, how we, we do. Keeping... Half this book is from them. Okay. So we are keeping a good track of, of the, those agencies. We the require UCA. them to submit a request for the appropriation and, and explain to us where the money is projected to go. And as their annual reports are, are uh, published, where they're required to give us a copy of that report for our records. Right. right. And the, the, other, the only other one I had a question on was Five Corners Intersection Improvements. I mean, I realize that we got the big money issues this year and we can't oh, do yeah. everything. But didn't we do a study on the accident rate down there? Yeah, it's the worst accident rate in the town. In fact, it's getting close to the worst accident rate on a town road in the county. So it's, it's, it's one that we continue to have accidents on, and eventually something will have to be done somehow to, to align that. So, uh, but, you know, even if we don't do, let's say, the, the, we're still thinking of trying to do something down there yes. to alleviate those problems, because that's a yeah. disaster. It can be very quickly. Yeah, I mean, driving down there is, is horrendous. So, I, so uh, no, I think you did a great job. I think it's good. I think we do need to look at it. I think, like Rick said, Absolutely. we need to uh, trim it up a little bit maybe or look at it. But uh, I think the issue, the, you know, the wastewater, the flooding, there, there are some issues that just have to be addressed. Yeah, they're immediate and they're life-threatening in many cases. Yeah. I will tell you that that five corners has come up every year for the 12 years I've been here. Yeah, no, it has. That's why it's on here. And there's people that are going to, would love to see that happen before they go on to the next. The better life, yes. shall we say. When their problems are over, they still like to see that right. taken care of before they go. Yeah, right. I, I know a lot of people have mentioned to me that they take their heart in their throat every time they drive through the intersection, not really? knowing what's going to happen. Somebody's coming this way, somebody's going that way. Nobody knows how to drive. Hopefully they don't meet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank we'll you, bring sir. This, keep bringing this up and keep thinking about it and talking about it. Uh, new business, 2017 Equalization Ratio Assessment Data Certificate. Now that's a mouthful. That comes yeah. from the assessing department. It's required by statute. Uh, I believe we've already signed it, <laughs> oh. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Um, it has to be, yes, it has to be done each year. This is it. This is the, the bright warning sign yep. from the state that it's here. Uh, and we, we do have to, uh, in fact, sign that every single year. Uh, it's a required form. We already know what it is. Uh, and the, uh, the equalization ratio uh, for 2017 is 92.7%. That indicates to me and I've talked to the assessor about this, that we're probably going to have money in the budget next year for revaluation because we're going to be under the statutory 90 percent put in by the Supreme, the Supreme Court and the legislature and the Constitution. So we're talking about a fairly large chunk of money for that next year. That we just did. Right. But the problem is that the, the sale of real estate is going so well that it is stripping the equalization factor that the court has ordered us to maintain at not less than 90%. So, 
It has to be, the, yeah, it has to be not over 90% or well, we have to revalue. Okay, anything else under new business? So how much is it now, That's did right. you say? 92.7 in two years. So we'll be over by the end of this year. Okay, closing comments? Motion to adjourn at 2043. Uh, seconded. Second. All in favor? Fine. Thank you, Channel 22. Thank you, folks.